forward and welcome our panelists on the stage. The panel discussion is on CMO dialogues, keeping the customer first, re-engineering the digital organization to better serve your customers. Joining us, our moderator, ladies and gentlemen in the house, put your hands together, make it loud, for Mr. Barada Sahu, co-founder and CEO, Mason. Joining us right now, please welcome Arjun Rastogi, co-founder, now again joining us on stage. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Joining us on stage, Sunaina Haldar, VP Marketing, Sleepy Cat. Wonderful to have you here with us this afternoon. Welcome. Please put your hands together. Loud round of applause for Rachna Gupta, co-founder, Gaino Veda. Huge. Everybody in the house, we're making up and we're applauding double, triple times. It will slowly get full, but we're leading forward and welcoming Beena Shah, partner and CMO, Mac Marais. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Sahil Gupta, co-founder, My Muse, joins us on stage. Thank you for your presence on our panel. Drishni Anand, co-founder, Let's Dress Up. She's right here with us this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen in the house, what we do best. Arjun Shah, CMO, Setu Nutrition, walks on the stage to that loud round of applause. And Vinayak Agarwal, founder and CEO, Bite Speed, joins our panel. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure it's loud. Our panelists, our moderator, sir, all yours. Yes, um, okay, I hope uh, all of you guys are able to hear me. And uh, thank you all for coming in post lunch. I know it's uh, uh, that time of the day when I'm sleepy, but uh, like you said, this Dhamda does not exist without the Bandiya Dhamda. This is the talk about the Bandiya Dhamda. <laughs> so, uh, we'll try and keep it fun. This is a very exciting panel. We're just having a discussion prior to some kind of walking over here. And I think we'll continue on that same theme, keep it a little bit more open conversation. And uh, we'll have to invite any questions that you have also and have a chat with us. So feel free. Uh, overall, the topic is about the consumer. Uh, like we spoke about, uh, for most of us running D2, D2C brands today, um, keeping the customer at the center becomes central to how you drive growth, how you kind of scale the business. And uh, keeping this customer first mindset is central to growth, right? And we'll speak a, as a little bit about that on the different levers for what drives this customer growth and how we kind of shape up our organizations, how we kind of shape up our thinking within our brands to kind of drive that. Uh, that said, uh, before I kind of jump in, I think uh, uh, everyone has got introduced hopefully to the panelists. But uh, the panelists could also touch upon a little bit on this product theme, which is about uh, how we put customers first, how central it is to drive growth, and maybe we take it on from there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Sitting to the right of the moderator means you always have to go first. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Sadhguru Gupta, um, co founder of My News, uh, founded the brand with my partner and, and uh, wife, uh, Anushka. Um, keeping the customer first, wow, I think that's that's essentially why we exist, right? I think a brand today is going to find it very difficult to lie to a consumer. I think consumers have become incredibly smart. I think they've managed to have all the options at their fingertips, um, you know, with the advent of the uh, worldwide internet. Um, I, I, I really do think this concept of putting the customer first is, is important in not just lip, lip service, not just saying that, hey, we're a brand that puts the customer first, but in all your actions. How do you actually ensure that that's happening? Um, certain ways, and I'll let some of the other panelists touch up on it, um, certain ways that you know, we can talk about in detail later is making sure that you're listening to your customer about what products they want to see. Having something like a beta tester program is so easy today. And customers are actually excited to participate in things like that, right? If you're, if you're willing to give your time to a customer, they are willing to give that back to you. So making sure that you're actually listening to the customer and you're making it easy for them to converse with you as a brand, I think that's something that we at Miami take very, very seriously. And, and, and it really helps us 
you know, not just in lip service to the idea that we should put the customer first. Yeah. Maybe uh, I just want you know, to talk about a little bit about how you think about this. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I'm Arjun, uh, one of the co-founders at Nagin. Uh, we make hot sauce, essentially. We've sort of expanded out into spices and uh, pantry essentials as well. But I think our calling card is very much in the hot sauce space. Um, I mean, I think Sahil kind of like said it. Um, we literally kind of do what we're doing because of the customers. Like if we really wanted to just make a really hard tasting hot sauce and you want to feed yourself, you just come up with a recipe and make it at home. Um, the reason you go to the regular world of making websites, I don't teams, kind of like getting the whole, you know, like everything going, like everything, the reason you're doing it is because you don't just want to have it yourself. It's not just like my Kharkas and Musaka recipe or something. It's literally like my mission is to get it to everybody. Um, we had it pretty straight, like the way we kind of saw it. We said there's um, Indian Chinese kind of sauces, there's Chinese sauces, there's Western sauces, there's Tabascos, there's Sirachas. But where's the Indian hot sauces? Like, for us, it's just been red and green chili sauce, which is pretty horribly reductive for a country with 3,000 chilies, right? Like, I mean, to be jalapeno, habanero, chipotle, harissa for global chilies, but then for India, it's red and green, is pretty tragic. So, what we really wanted to do is kind of make a name for Bhutra Road. I talk about how Kantari chili is like our bird's eye chili or like whatever, but Really, at the end of the day, this is about making sure or like kind of hoping that people come along with the bandwagon along with us, right? Like, um, and I think one of the things I just, I mean, we can get into this a little bit more, but like one of the things I want to really share is people, and this might be a little out of like the flow of things, but I wanted to say, is like people have like a weird relationship with brands, at least I did, like growing up, right? Like, I mean, it was this machine, it was a name, it was on a bus stop, it was on a billboard, and then you go into a store one day and then you get your product. Like it's really different today. Um, you're a person, you're like you could be part of the brand, the brand is part of you. Like the whole dynamic is extremely different. Um, and I think the idea is you to sort of embrace that and treat each person like they're a person and not a number. Um, I hope nobody with Vodafone is involved with this event because I've I think we may have all had a version of a horrific customer service experience at some point. Insert telecom provider of your choice or airline, you know, customer service of your choice. I think the idea is the first time a customer talks to you and they're like, oh, this guy's, he's listening to me. Like, and, that's, and, and it's crazy to me that the bar's so low that you can literally, like, walk over. Right? Like, I mean, you don't need to hop, you don't need to jump, you don't need to train, you can just be you, pretend that that's, it's literally that simple and people will appreciate you a little bit more already. So I think the idea is to somewhat embrace the idea that you're not a separate entity anymore, these are people, and just interact one to one wherever you get a chance. Yeah. I, I think I'll jump over to maybe Vishri, because she's been speaking about how the brand and the consumer identity uh, the creator identities are no longer separate, and maybe if you can speak a little bit about that, right? Thank because it's just right you, on point. Can, can you hear me? Because I'm going to ask you a question to all the people in the house, especially women. So if you love dressing up, please raise your hand. Please raise your hand. And even the men can raise their hand if they don't have to be shy about it. And excellent, right? So this is what I did when I started my brand, Let's Dress Up, two years back. You know, when I felt the pain point of women uh, dressing up and what are the hassles they face, the first thing I did was dial my friends, my friends of friends, and it eventually ended up, you know, talking to 1,500 plus women before I actually took my entrepreneur plunge. And that is when I realized the power of insight. But what exactly the brand is, and why do we have to even call it customer centric? Here. The answer lies in the question itself. A brand is, you know, for, for me or for anyone, for the, for the user, it's, it's an emotion. You know, you kind of connect with it. So if you are not connecting with it, or if you don't think about it, it's not a brand, it's probably just a company. You know, like you were talking about putting a name on a billboard or something where you do not connect, where it is not an emotion, and then it's just a company, right? So. If there is something which is emotion, then how can you just rule out customer out? And
and that is when a brand is equal to a customer. So, if, and that is how each of the brands probably they are revolving around the customer is what is more important. So, at that dress up, after talking to audience like you and majorly women, uh, we are building the most size inclusive brand for women in India, where we have sizes from extra small to apex. Why? Because if you are aware, the maximum number of returns which take place in the fashion industry or in the e-commerce industry for that matter, is in the fashion world, it is 30 to 40 percent and majorly because of this fix. And this is data which was, you know, marrying what I talk with the consumers which are majorly women and that's how, you know, you build something which the users already want. So that is the power of creating a brand equal to a customer. And that is fabulous, and I just love the speak that you're doing over there. And maybe what I will jump on along these lines of uh, customer centricity. Yeah. One part is speaking about uh, bringing customers into the uh, fold of how you go about building a brand. I think uh, everybody's here has spoken a little bit uh, within the panel with Raksha, uh, and she's kind of spoken about the power of community over there and uh, how customers are now uh, helping you grow that brand, build that brand up. I am Raksha Gupta, co-founder of Kano We are an Ayurvedic supplements company for women's health. Uh, pretty much on a mission to solve the problems that women go through from puberty to menopause. Uh, and I think when you know this opportunity came to me to be on the panel, I think consumer first, uh, I, I think it's a highly abused word. Every entrepreneur in this room is passionate. Every entrepreneur in this room uh, you know, things about the consumer. Uh, every entrepreneur wants to do things with the consumer or for the consumer. I think I'm going to start with a little different philosophy and blame it on my age. Uh, being in my late 40s and having started uh, this uh, enterprise uh, in our mid 40s with my husband, Trisha, and I are both co-founders of my I think can't tell but to talk about philosophy. Uh, I think the day each one of us as an entrepreneur resigns to the fact that we exist because we are solving a problem of this. I think your entire perspective changes. Uh, it's not because it's been taught in books. It's not because you see competition doing it. It's not because you want to get your NPS scores right. It's not because you want to have higher average order value or your retention should be higher. I think it's very the right thing to do. Uh, and it's the right thing to do with your consumers. So if you start with that perspective, honestly, everything that you do in your life revolves on the consumers. And there's always this tussle back at home between uh, Shad and me and uh, Ajay, or is a dear friend, he can watch for it. We say there are two CEOs at home. One is a chief executive officer, which is Vishal, and one is a chief empathy officer, which is Because the world of women's health that we are solving has to begin with the consumer at the center. Right from the fact that how did we, three years back, how would we even gather data points about a woman who is having issues with the menstrual cycle, a woman who is finding it difficult to conceive, a young girl who has been battling with polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, why would she come and talk to us? Both of us are not doctors. Both of us had spent about 17 to 20 years in the corporate world. Uh, just because we one fine day decided that, you know, there's been a significant change in our life and we want to extend that to the larger consumer community. Uh, why would somebody trust us? So I think it started with an innate need to say, why would a stranger even want to give me her data points about her intimate health? Uh, and I think that has been till date. It's been it's been over three years. Very grateful for the kind of uh, growth that we've seen. I think very grateful for the kind of lives uh, we have impacted. But I don't think uh, had the consumer not been the focal point, uh, this would have happened. So I think it's no longer about consumer first. I think it's only about consumers. And I would like to rephrase uh, that perspective. All the other stakeholders are separate. Your consumer decides whether your business is here to stay 
whether your business is going to sustain, be it COVID, be it any kind of uh, you know external factors, and whether it's going to be a thriving business in times to come, and are you leaving behind the legacy? So I think early on, I realized that I want to talk to consumers, not as Rachna, the co-founder, but as Rachna, a woman, and as a mother of you know a teenager. And I think with that perspective, we decided to build a community. Now, of course, what was the easiest thing to do is leveraging Facebook uh, for our ad spends. And because I had already been on several communities and seen the power of communities, I thought that's the best place to get started with. Uh, so literally two, two and a half years back, we did our first paying consumer to say, come and join this community. You'll have me along with our team of doctors giving you daily advice, giving you daily tips. We handhold you. We'll celebrate, uh, you know, your successes. We'll celebrate your narratives. And I think the intent was just to create this very safe, non-judgmental, non-intrusive space for women. Uh, and till date, these women don't show they're forever confused as to who's the founder, who's the co-founder. Uh, we have a team of doctors, our third partner, Dr. Aki Patel is a gynecologist. She's on the community. I think we've kept it going to. And just because it's been authentic, it's been accessible, and it's been a lot of value creation because it's not a man talking to these people, it's women talking to women saying, I understand what you go through. Thankfully today we've uh, reached over 77 k women only in the community, which is the largest uh, Indian Facebook group on the student reproductive health. So I think uh, you know, it's, it's not about wanting to do as per there is no B2C playbook uh, that can tell you uh, what your consumers want. I think it's just your selfish need uh, to know what your consumers want. And literally, like we say in Amir Veda, there's something called as Nadi Parisha, catching the pulse of what a person is going through to determine what's the problem. I think if you have to consumer, Nadi Nadi Bata, then seriously there is a problem. I mean, this is this uh, this insights uh, coming from and having run this group. I mean, it is like uh, you're talking about these two co CEOs. I see empathy precedes exhibition, <laughs> and so so this is like one of those uh, ways to kind of go about building a brand. And we talk about not having a playbook, but I think you're almost giving away your secrets and the playbook here to the audience. So you're speaking about you know what? Unless you speak to consumers, unless you connect to consumers, you really don't have a brand. The first place to I, I like to add one point here, Prashna, like she said, Chief Empathy Officer. So, uh, even me and my husband, uh, we are the co founders. So, I am the Chief Pain Officer and he's the Chief Solutions Officer. So, we have this thing where I, you know, get all the pain points, you know, from the consumer, from the users, and that's where he's working on getting the right solutions. So, I think again, it is about getting the go out. So, go all pain that. there. All the acronyms are now getting changed over. I see CPO, as team pain of his community. And fabulous. Uh, I think uh, Sunil, I'm going to just jumping over to you. Right? I mean, uh, in this category where we just been like, it's the fundamental need category. Almost, uh, you say everybody, like you said, needs a mattress. Everybody has a mattress, right? And in this space of like, how we kind of break out, this category itself starts with very understanding consumers and their needs. Right? And so, maybe you can speak a little bit about that. And, Yeah, sure, thanks. Uh, is, is this on? Can anyone hear me? Okay. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Sunaina. I'm a uh, marketing for Sleepycat. It's a sleep solutions company. So we make mattresses, pillows, comforters, anything to get people cozy and comfortable uh, in bed. Um, I think for us, one of the things like you were mentioning, Barada, is that uh, the mattress category itself is it's crowded with traditional players, there are new age players coming in, there are just so many guys. In fact, I was telling to, uh, uh, my co panelists earlier, if I were to ask all of you which what is the brand of mattress that you're speaking on, not everybody really knows. So it's it's really core to everyone's life. Like you spend almost a third of your life on your mattress, but not everybody is as involved with the mattress. Probably because uh, till now or till a few years ago, uh, it was seen as a commodity. It's just a place that you come and you sleep at the end of the day. But of late, uh, the new brands that have started coming in uh, have really started uh, connecting to their consumers. Right? And there is a there's a story, there's a reason why these brands exist. And 
What I realized when I came to into the DTC uh, space is that uh, with the number of choices that consumers have today, I don't think any brand has an option but to be consumer first. And with all of us being in the DTC kind of space, I don't think with the, with the amount of data that we have at our fingertips, we don't have an excuse but to be consumer first. Right? And uh, for us at Sleepy Cat, it's very important uh, to be distinct so that we have a clear cut brand stand for people uh, enabling consumers to really give an equal priority to their best in this hustle culture that's all around where you know you have stories of people uh, waking up early in the morning and hustle, 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 but that rest and that sleep which is so critical for individual success, that kind of takes a back seat. And that's what we stand for. All of these things come from consumer stories, right? Um, uh, and yeah, I mean, what we try to do is really uh, see the consumer as one good then friend. You know, like if you, if I were to say that, uh, if, I, if I watch a new show on uh, on Netflix, I know exactly which friend is going to like it. If I go to a restaurant, I know whom to recommend it to. Uh, if there's an experience, I know that, but uh, I, I think you would love this experience. Why? Because I have spent the time and effort to know this about my friends. And uh, that's something I think that we consciously have to do, uh, is to really invest that kind of uh, time and effort in getting to know the consumers. And it's, it's not that complicated. I mean, we don't even have to get to, you know, um, getting to know their motivations, their anxieties, fears, etc. Yes, that can come at, at a certain stage of the consumer first journey, but it really starts off with three very simple things. Uh, what is my consumer's need? What do they like? And what do they not like? And that, I think if we, if we can uh, get everyone in the organization to get a basic strong understanding of that, it helps with uh, ensuring that whatever initiatives are taken up by, at least we've seen that whatever initiatives we take up, the chances of success are a little bit better. If we get to know the consumer better, like you know, the pulse of the consumer, it's, it's as simple as that. Uh, right, and especially you know, in a space where the success of a brand is decided by whether that consumer clicks or swipes past you or scrolls past you, uh, it's those few seconds, right? And it, unless everybody has that really strong intuitive understanding, I think it's a little bit Yeah, I think, uh, thanks, thanks for sharing this. And, and what I do is I just jump across to so Arjun and uh, you know, very distinct categories almost. And on one side, you have this category where everybody needs it, everybody is aware of it, but you've got to stand out in that category. On the other side where people don't even know whether this need exists, right? And you've got to kind of create awareness in some sense about this. So we'd love to understand from that perspective how you go about being that very consumer first lens to kind of building up and developing products. And yeah. Right. Uh, so for those of you who might not be aware, I need the marketing for CD nutrition the health and supplements brand. Um, there's always an apprehension for anybody to, con to purchase something to consume, right? If you're purchasing something, maybe uh, like a perfume or a cosmetics or a mattress or an electronics, um, it doesn't directly impact your health if things go wrong, right? But with health supplements, so putting it inside, you have a lot of apprehensions, you know, like, um, my stomach will upset, will I have a reaction, will I be able to digest it okay, uh, is it really beneficial, hope there are no nasties uh, in this. So there are a lot of apprehensions that anyone has when they uh, consume uh, something like this. And I'd say too, the biggest challenge for us was to figure out how do we solve for these apprehensions, how do we predict uh, and anticipate what are the things that the customers would be concerned about and we address them. So we have a very simple mantra I'd say too in terms of any decision we make is are we adding value to the customer and does this make sense to the customer. So right from when we do new product development, uh, coming up with a new formulation, we're like okay, is this a need in the market? Are customers looking to solve uh, for this? Um, is the communication that we put out for this particular product uh, making sense to the customer? You hardly get 5, 10, 15 seconds. So 
Our main mantra has been that when we make any big decision, are we being able to add value to the customer? And we do a lot of customer calling, getting a lot of customer feedback, adding a lot of data on uh, retention, usage, um, in case people have any side effects. We spend a lot of effort on scanning what people review uh, us on Amazon or on our website. And it's also about getting quick action in those cases. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the products that we had, um, what we realized is that one of the ingredients in, in, in those products to some people was a little harder to digest, right? So uh, we then set out on a journey to call and talk to all our customers who have consumed the product to understand if any of them did face that issue. We then guided them on how they can alter the way they can use the product so that they don't face those issues. And we didn't have to do anything else but just guide the customers in the right way to use it. And I think that in effect, in effect, the effort that the brand made to reach out to the customer and talk to them gave some sort of comfort to the users to trust the brand, right? That even if something didn't go exactly that way, because the brand has reached out, the brand has taken the pain to understand my problem and has solved it for me. Um, we've seen these customers go on to become one of the most loyal advocates of our brand as well. So it's it's starting from having a mantra that every decision you make, are you adding value to the customer? Constantly being in touch with your customers to understand how they are feeling, how they are liking the product, and if and when you think there is a apprehension, taking the effort to address it because it's not going to directly affect your top line on that day, but in time to come, it will affect your LTV. So, in this fast pace world of B2C, B2 we tend to forget that everything is not here and now, but it is about investing for the future. I mean, uh, I mean it's basically, uh, at the end of the day, the business only exists if there's repeat. Right. If there's new customer business, you can't make a business for a going. And I think, maybe just touching upon that, you know, like, where you, uh, I think Anji spoke about a little bit about connecting to the customer, reaching out to the customer. Now you're running this uh, technology form which basically helps you get there, right? get, get out to the customer. Hearing your perspective of how you work across brands, some of these approaches that brands should lean in on maybe how, how you kind of connect to this customer. So there is some communities, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, how you kind of go about. Sure. Uh, I guess uh, I'm an uh, I run a company called uh, White Speed. Uh, we actually work brands to help them uh, reduce their dependency on uh, Facebook ads uh, and instead help them establish a direct channel on WhatsApp, uh, whether it's to drive revenue, whether it's to uh, collect feedback, send shipping notifications, bunch of stuff that we do there. Um, so uh, I think uh, like at least, uh, and also like, even from uh, all the discussions so far, like, whether it's uh, so for certain brands, it will be community, uh, that's a very strong need. Uh, in certain brands, let's say like, maybe uh, education, right? Uh, that you just need to uh, convey to the customer, like how to use this, why this is important, why this is different. Um, so the use cases vary, uh, but the need to have a direct one-to-one -one connect uh, does persist. Uh, and we just saw that um, with how brands were being built uh, in the past, uh, it was very hard to do that. Uh, and a big part of uh, the reason uh, to do a D2C uh, was to be able to get closer to the customer and just have your own website uh, if not anything. Um, and WhatsApp as a channel, has uh, enabled some of this, uh, whether it's on, uh, let's say, the commerce side. So some products, especially, let's say, which are more uh, high rapid product value, sometimes require more uh, assistance. It's very similar to you go to the retail store if you are looking to buy, let's say, something like a mattress, right? Like, I don't want to do, like, any touch it, feel it, right? Uh, so some of these things, um, we are able to then uh, at least uh, answer questions on WhatsApp that we have. Uh, I'm going to buy a mattress, I at least have these five pictures, okay, I'm going to buy it without uh, actually paying it. Uh, but then I need to know like these four or five things. Uh, will it fit my bed? Um, like, and I can research online to figure out like, how do I actually buy the mattress. Uh, but then I need to ask the brand if like, this is actually there or not. I can do that. Um, and this has actually, we also took uh, insight from what has happened in other similar markets. Right? Like, for example, China would be a good example. Uh, I was just doing some video the other day, and from what I remember, I think it was like maybe a uh, amount of 500 billion dollars of GMP that was just done on WeChat. Um, and uh, India, at least actually being somewhat similar, uh, we were excited to see that, okay, is this something uh, that also happens here? 
so this is like one part of the um, 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 problem uh, being solved in just the common side. Then what we've also seen is that when it comes to uh, personalization, right? Uh, uh, one part of personalization is just what was being captured as um, interactions on the website, right? Okay, somebody went to the website, browsed this product, left, that kind of stuff was already happening for a while. Uh, what a channel like WhatsApp, which is more one to one also related, uh, was asking questions directly. So let's say uh, I'm a brand that's, let's say, maybe um, building some, uh, send, sending out some clothes for um, um, uh, very young kids, right? Like maybe um, just toddlers, and their age keeps on changing. So uh, if I know that okay, uh, it's now like uh, three months old, six months old, and I should just send out some products accordingly, uh, I get to personalize my communication that way. Uh, and we've also seen some brands being like very quirky there. Like for example, uh, I think it was an apparel brand that uh, was working with us. Um, they would actually ask the size, uh, and like in some cases they observed that the size were varying. Really. So they were like, okay, fine, uh, if the size was M, like maybe six months ago, and like, it's dropped to S, they would send out some communication saying, hey, uh, hey congrats on that. Uh, if you've lost some weight, why don't you uh, check out these uh, new t-shirts? Uh, so a bunch of things you've seen uh, on this front. So it's bringing the inclusivity that Drishti spoke about. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, I was wondering what happens if somebody went to small to <laughs>
we try to rally and bring in the crowd a little bit. So we've spoken about, at, at MyMuse, we think about uh, selling to our customer. It goes with the three C's, right? So we all talked about commerce and we talked about community. The third C was also recently mentioned. Does anyone know what the third C is? There you go. So someone yelled it out, all right? It's content, exactly. When we think about, about how we are approaching the customer today, those three are interlocking Venn diagrams, right? You cannot have commerce today without having the right community and the right content for that community. I think today the advent of community is used very often, right? Every brand says, yes, I have a community, yes, I have a community. But I think really trying to, I think we talked about, you know, uh, value earned. What value are you providing to your customer? We at MyMuse feel that one of the values that we have to provide to our customer is what they can already get for free on the internet today. And that is boatloads of content. No matter what type of content the consumer <coughs> wants today, that's available for free online. So the idea of community building when we think about it is this concept of content curation, right? This concept of, look, brands today have this responsibility to help educate the customer, right? And if you're doing so, the only real way is to do it through authentic, relatable, and very consumable content, right? This concept of building a community, if, if you talk to any of us today, how can we build our communities? It's by being either our true authentic selves, it's by telling our stories, and all of these are content pieces that are consumable by customers today. They either buy into that philosophy or they don't buy into that philosophy. But I think, I, I don't think you can start community building. I don't think you can, I don't think you can uh, uh, effectively say that I have retention in my community without truly thinking about you know, how am I speaking to that customer? How does that customer need me to be speaking to them? I'll give you an example of how we think about our content at my news. So what we realized very quickly and very early on was that a lot of people need answers to this very basic question in sexual wellness. And the question is, am I not? Right? That's it. That's all that people really care about, you know. And they don't have any outlet to ask that question to really anyone. You can't ask your friends because they may make fun of you. You can't ask the internet because there's all sorts of different answers to that question. And you can't ask your close family members who you usually go to advice because people aren't there yet. Right? So us as a brand, how do we become that content hub, that trusted source, that place of community where that consumer can actually ask those questions that they are otherwise afraid to ask, right? And I think then once you figure out that problem, like what type of content am I trying to create, then you need to think about medium, right? And as many of us have discussed earlier, there are different mediums based on whichever brand you know you have. A big medium for us at MyMuse is email. Email remains one of the only push marketing techniques that has low cap today. One of the only places where you can talk to a customer like a friend and a confidant, right? When you're writing to a pen pal, it's anonymous on email, right? And so we thought that as the right way to serve our community is to do it through content that's highly relatable because I, I know oftentimes, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm sure some of you may have been targeted by mining's ads, right? Oftentimes, people say that we're a youth-focused brand. We don't actually hold that to be true. If you look at our orders, they are all the way, we get emails from people who are, from women who are above 50 years old being like, don't forget about us too, right? The idea is to try to really understand how can you intersect those circles of content, commerce, and community such that commerce becomes an afterthought and a part of that journey. The, the idea is to 
create safe spaces such that dialogue can be started and that's how you build the trust to make that consumer jump to you because you're a curator of information that they otherwise need to Google or chat GTT or <coughs> So I, I love this side of what you're speaking about. You know, uh, speaking about marketing of the four P's, I think they're changing three <coughs> C's for the deep C space, right? And basically, as long as you keep that at the center, this uh, content, community, and customers, and basically see this intersection happening where commerce is enough to talk to uh, beyond that, right? I would love to jump across to uh, the Russia, right? Like, uh, uh, speak about email being one of those prime mediums for you, and this community-centered approach is something that you've also done very well. I'd love to kind of hear the parts about how to kind of go about thinking about community, how to go about building your own community, right? Uh, maybe get some perspective. You should change the name of the session from so much of it does uh, not exist without the community. Yeah, I mean, we should keep our uh, you know time of watch because that's such a passion subject for us. So I really don't know uh, where does one begin and where does one start. But I'll, I'll say interestingly, building upon what Sahil just spoke about, right? And uh, this is something that I think uh, we intuitively follow at Night of And I'm going to give it a term which we have coined. It's called Jimmy. J stands for journey. Uh, I think ascension, whether it's community, whether it's WhatsApp marketing, whether it's email, whether it's SMS, whatever, I think that comes much later. The first thing is do we really understand where does your consumer begin? In our case, because it's women's health, it's her. So where does she begin her journey with the discovery of Dynamina to then building a likability towards the brand to then building the trust factor which is saying okay I am in the consideration uh, mode to then saying okay finally I rest my hands and I surrender to the brand. I think there is a huge upside in that context. And a lot of times you know because there is this whole pressure to uh, suddenly build scale and D2C is booming and everyone wants to jump on the bandwagon. I think a lot of us lose perspective again. Uh, of the input. We get so focused on the output. consumer ko and consumer ko retention And then fundamentally, I think that's where the problem begins. So I think at least in our case, because like I said, very intuitive, we are solving women's health. Uh, we are into healthcare as a country. So extremely real, extremely responsible, uh, and a need to build a long-term relationship because uh, just like we mentioned for safety nutrition, our minimum consumption duration is 90 days. Maximum even in cases of where women have tried IUI, IVF and have had unsuccessful attempts, then come to Ayurveda because it's still considered the last resort, right? And so they are extremely low on patients. How do you build a nurturing relationship with her for her to stay with you uh, for 6 months, 12 months? And I think retention is an outcome of that. Uh, so I would, I would just have one correction here that one needs to be very clear what is an input metric and what's an output metric. Retention is an output metric of the work that you have done with your consumer. So that, back to my earlier point of J, which is user journey, where does she discover your brand and until when does she stay connected to you to an extent that she has now become a promoter. Which means if you simply ask her, would you recommend Dinoveda to your friends and family and if the answer is yes and that's pretty much what we measure by way of industry and we score. Right? So it starts with journey. I think when you're building this journey and when you are talking to thousands of consumers, what we really undermine is the value of insights, which is the I of journey. The power of insights, I think, absolutely underrated. Uh, we depend on a lot of research agencies to come and tell us what is the competition landscape. We depend on them to tell us what the total library is market. We hear these terms, scan, sand, song. All of us in the D2C world are used to that. But trust me, I think the answer lies in what your consumer wants. Uh, and that's actually how it's worked extremely well for us. First 18 months uh, when we launched in uh, early 2020 until late 21, we were only focused on seven products. I think what it gave us is absolutely a deep dive first hand into what a woman wants when she's dealing with PCOS, 
stress or she's dealing with delayed feelings or she's facing any of the other issues. I think it got us so deeply connected with the insights that that's where a gold mine opened up of saying, hey, I love what you've done uh, with respect to my menstrual cycle and I really trust you. Why don't you come up with wellness products? And which is where the next 18 months were, the whole NPD funnel just opened up by listening to a consumer. So I think insights, extremely powerful, I would say explosive, uh, and I wish a lot of us together as a community can really leverage that. The end is going to be the medium that Sally just spoke about. Once you know what your consumer wants, the medium automatically happens. You don't choose the medium first and then look at is your consumer going to be found. Because we were D2C, uh, because we were catering to a younger audience, it's quite natural that you're going to acquire through Facebook, Instagram, Google, YouTube, but you can't retain. It's an absolutely, in our case, failed remarketing, retargeting to me. So the retention is one to one. Your acquisition is one to many. Uh, and so you will have to use social channels for acquisition. But your retention happens through a lot of uh, retention automation tools where you can again back to defining the journeys. So I think the medium, uh, if you're dealing with a smaller cohort uh, who is looking for consultation, that's where we use WhatsApp. Uh, the larger group is the Facebook community called Circle of Sisterhood. That's pretty much to build the world's largest online space on menstrual and reproductive health. But that's, that's like I said, more women to women. When a brand wants to communicate uh, a new product, then we use email. So I think the medium choice happens depending on where the user journey is. Uh, and the last I is iterations. Um, I, I, I don't know how many hundreds of iterations we would have done. I don't think we've still got it right. Mines and mines to go. still are tweeting, but there is fun in iterations. I just spoke about hustle. I think that for us in the consumer world is, are you iterating enough uh, to get it right? And uh, your, whether your AOV increases, whether your retention increases, whether your LTV to CAC increases, I think all that pretty much becomes an of good So I think that was the framework uh, that we actually also used in the community. And because we spoke about uh, three Brilliant, brilliant. Okay. And the whole world maybe is Also, from this, uh, we spoke a little bit about community. You know, but uh, community does not exist without content, as we say, curated content. People have access to this content. Both of the packages. How important has this content? Because we speak about journeys, we speak about communities, and none of them exist without what you are communicating to customers. And this uh, communication comes from the content that you brand, the stories that you kind of stitch together. I'd love to kind of hear it.
Um, it, it, I mean, it's, it's just not it, right? And whatever we've said, we all exist to solve the consumer And if you think that something's going to work, know that my consumer has said that no, that's not going to work, I think that's, it's, there's no argument there beyond that. And the third thing is to really um, make the, the process easier and more accessible. I think one of the challenges that we faced was that uh, everyone understands that the consumer process is important, or getting to know your consumer but in a startup environment, there's always a part of the Something else is always more urgent. So how do you make it easy for the team to really uh, do, you know, put, put their time in this? Is that we uh, make the data, of course, data is accessible to everyone. Consumer data is easily accessible to everyone. And we give them uh, the ability to spend their time on it. So we lock off half a day. Let's say once in two weeks, we lock off half a day when there are no calls, no meetings. But that is time that is spent with the students. Whether you're doing a call, whether you're doing an analysis, whether you're doing, you know, whatever it is, it's fine. We just exchange our insights after that and maybe once a month circulate it to everyone else. Again, we try to keep it as simple as possible. It's not the fancy. It's just an email of good. But it's about, I think, uh, for this journey, I mean, you know, even when it comes to content, for us, it's one of those things like you mentioned about delegation. The consistency is more important than the intensity. So we have to just ensure that there is a framework or there is uh, there's a buy-in across the organization that people will spend that time. Because unless you do that grand work, uh, unless you have that discipline, it's not something that just comes one time a day, right? It's, there is a lot of input that goes into getting that information. Absolutely. I think this is one of the toughest points, right? Like he's speaking about community, he's speaking about how content is the kind of the pillar of community, but if you to take a step back, it's insights. It actually drives what you need to do in the first place. And if you're not spending enough time on your insights, you really don't have a content of community to speak about, right? At that point. So we'll also kind of hear from Arjun maybe like how you kind of uh, jump in into this insight space. What are we kind of uh, picked up over there? What are you kind of doing? And if you share with you so there's a lot of data <laughs> that we work with and <clears throat> give some examples. I think for us it's important to understand that we pick up one word is iterations, right? So there's iterations on product, there's iterations on content, there's iteration on ads. Uh, there's a continuous iteration on everything. Um, I'll take an example of, of one of our products, right? So we launched uh, a product called as Ashwagandha Gummies and it was one of the products that was uh, we knew it was a good product, but uh, we weren't sure under what use case people buy it, right? And <clears throat> so we launched the product, we experimented with a lot of different types of marketing. Um, and then once we, it was literally launched just to sell about 100 to 200 packs to see why people are buying it, right? And we quickly realized that Ashwagandha's related to stress and a survey of all the people who bought the early round of the product, um, we realized that most people are buying it uh, for stress and anxiety and that led us to add a few more ingredients, repurpose the product and now we are relaunching it as a stress relief. Um, again, whether it's going to be successful or not, is time will tell. But the point here is that this is the way we are using the data. It's not only about the data, but it's also about how we recognize what people are buying the products for, how we recognize um, what is the solution we are giving them, what is the value we are adding to the customer, and then how we then quickly iterate the product, how agile we are in going from idea to first launch, to data collection, to relaunching, right? So that entire journey is, it takes time, but the faster we can do it, the faster we can beat our market to it because I'm pretty sure that most of our competition is thinking on the same line. There's somebody there applying their mind and figuring out what's going to work, what's not going to work. Um, and in, in the crowded space that we are in, what we realized is that anybody can go ahead and launch like a, like a multivitamin or can go ahead and launch uh, like a collagen or any commoditized like a fish oil. But where we are trying to uh, put out a differentiator is in terms of launching curated products for specific problems of the 21st century. And in order for us to do that, 
We also have to anticipate what a customer might need and maybe they are not be sure what they might need as well. So it's, it's, it's a tough spot to be in, but the faster you iterate, the faster you uh, analyze your data and the faster you can turn around your entire supply chain is where you find a success. So, Vrishyam, we would love to come across to you and maybe kind of get your perspective on this, like, the speed of iteration cycles that you're speaking about. Right? Like, uh, uh, there's from inside to it, defining the supply chain, to kind of creating new products, launching it, and then getting this feedback back in the loop. That kind of drives it. What's been your uh, observations over there? So, at Let's Press Up, you know, we have a very unique we are very unique as compared to any other fashion brand or label you want to call it. It's because, you know, we have we are a customer first rather than a designer gut approach. Right? So most of the brands or fashion labels, if you see, they are originating designs because the designer feels hey, this should be what the user should wear. But at Let's Dress Up, we want the user to tell us what they want to wear and that's when the designers start working. And then, you know, like if I take a step back and get the insights, get the data. But now, that is what, you know, we, we leverage in this age. So there are n number of places where you can find consumers dropping hints. It's only dependent upon your intelligence, how you triangulate and you get the right product. It's like you say, you know, you anticipate the next product or sorry, the next step of the consumer is going to take. We anticipate like, okay, this, so this is the next outfit the user is wanting. And once you launch it, right, the, it, it's like, wow, it's created a boom. And why I say this, because in the last six months, we've grown from a crore analyzed revenue to 10 CR analyzed revenue, which is 90% of it coming from only one category. Why? Because that category was well thought through because the users want it and are not dependent on any designer to come up and you know bring this. Now to get that insight is also an art. To get that data is also an art. And when I talk about if I am today at this scale and I want to go to 100 CR, it is talking about personalization at scale. How are you going to continue doing this when you reach the masses? And that is where technology comes in. That is where your own website, the data on your website comes in. That is where there is a lot of data available on whether it is Google Trends, whether it is competitor trends, whether it is uh, social listening. It is going to tell you. And only then you triangulate and reach that thing which you want. And this is the philosophy we follow at this. The other thing which we actively do is to conversate with the client. It's not necessary that I sit or I have a team who sits and just keeps talking to clients. That is a part of it. But at every step, once the consumer knows about you, at every step you start conversating with the clients. Be it there on your landing page, be it on your website, WhatsApp, and that's how you start gathering those insights. So that is the power of how you can just, you know, just scale it one category because you put in all that thoughts. And as far as speed is concerned, because the technology, you're leveraging it to collect data, the, because also we have a very nimble supply chain. So in case that 1%, you know, you want the feedback coming in, you are able to make that change very, very fast. Which other brands will not be able to do so because they come up with a collection, they made a huge inventory and they kept it and now they sell it. Now they can't make those changes. But for us, where we have a digital design technology, we have nimble supply chains, backed by a lot of data, that's when the, you are able to get the, to the right you know, set of clients with the right set of outputs. One thing that I get here is where... This is a small example of using data, right? We analyze um, our purchase behavior uh, by time, right? What we realize is that uh, our development products are typically purchased between 7 and 11. And our mind focus and uh, performance products are typically purchased between 10 and 4. 10 and 4. So, uh, it sounds very logical now that I'm tired at work, maybe I need some supplements that we were 
by who I'm not getting sleep as, and by I, I, I look for melanin products at night. Um, but what do you do with this information? So all our performance marketing spends get divided by the hour, right? So we scale up spends for categories that people are buying in the day. We scale up spends for people for categories that, are, that people are buying at night. And that has helped us to get some sort of improvements in our overall um, uh, performance metrics as well. And, <clears throat> and it's, it sort of made us realize that, hey, you know, we thought that maybe this is a category that might not work on performance, but maybe people want electronic strips at night, right? So maybe it's, it's time to think about something on performance. You know, this is one of those fabulous things that uh, the whole team out here, that everybody, they're so tuned in into their consumers and the data and the technology that they're adopting. That this is what gives them the edge over all their traditional retailers because they're still thinking supply chains which are going to take months to years to kind of execute. And you guys are thinking like, can I do it at a particular time of uh, the day, right? And that's very different mindset, right? Like this kind of shift that you're seeing. And I'm pretty sure this is something that hopefully the audience is taking away. Um, we're kind of coming up on time, but I think this has been a fabulous discussion. It's been great to speak to every one of you. Does any Questions from the audience would kind of have to take it uh, last couple of questions. Do you have time for that? Awesome. No, no worries. I think this has been great to speak to everyone. And uh, I hope uh, uh, all of you also got uh, some takeaways from this. I had a great time speaking to everyone. Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming together. Thank you. Let's, let's put our hands together for our panelists, our moderator. Group photograph, please. Can we please request you to join up the Join us for the group photograph. Yes, thank you. Up front, if you all want. Thank you so much. Mr. Sahu, thank you for moderating. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for our moderator, our panelists, Mr. Arjun Rastogi from Nagin, Sunena Haldar from Sleepy Cat, Rachna Gupta from Gainoveda, Binal Shah from Matt Marai, Sahil Gupta, My Muse, Drishti Anand, Let's Dress Up, Arjun Shah from Setu Nutrition, Vinayak Agarwal from Bite Speed. Thank you so much. Once again, a loud round of applause for our moderator, Barada Sahu Mason. Thank you, thank you.